This is one of some 30 workable seams in the Northumberland coalfield. They extend over several hundred of kilometres throughout the coalfields of North East England. Here we have, in fact, a split seam with a dirt band in the middle, but the two leaves of coal together will give us something like a metre of coal, very typical of the coalfields of Great Britain. So here we've got a bed of organic matter, very wide in extent, but only very thin, and separated by several metres of plastic materials like this from the next seam, which must lie above or down beneath us. Most people throw the coal on the fire without really looking at it, but there's a wealth of detail to be seen there. If we examine it fairly closely, we can see several of the components or mussels which make up the coal itself. And here's some examples. Here we can see the bright, lustrous vitrinite, made up of the decomposed plant or bark material. This is the dull, splinty durain containing much inertinite material. And here we can see the charcoal-like powder which is believed to have been formed in forest fires. But that is the organic matter in the seams. There is also the impurities as well. And here we can see examples of those. Here, a dirt band, which gives the ash for the coal. And here, the yellow pyrite, which when the coal is burned, will give us sulphur dioxide. We've talked about the coal seam being formed of organic matter. So here is some of the evidence for it. This is a fossilised plant remain which has been preserved in the shales associated with the coal seam. And in this specimen we can see rootlets of the plants in which originally grew to form the coal seams and which have been preserved in the clays underneath the seam so indicating that this was a fossil soil. Above the seam there are a series of sedimentary layers of mudstone and sandstone until we get to another seam. So here is a cycle of deposits. Soil, coal, sediments and then another coal. In this part of the world this sequence is repeated at least five times below and twenty or more times above. But this isn't just a regular pile of continuous sheets on top of one another. We said you can trace a seam for several kilometres, but locally, look at this here. What happens to our top leaf? Here our top leaf is missing completely. A river channel has cut down through the sediments overlying the coal seam and has cut away the coal seam itself. This is a washout. And elsewhere on the site, we have seen a seam split into two separate beds, a seam split. So, in what type of environment would this diverse and rapidly changing series of sediments be deposited? Coal-forming plants, it's thought, thrived in very flat, coastal, swampy areas. With soils at or below water level. Gradual subsidence allowed dead plant material to accumulate in the anaerobic waters to form peat. Swamps like this exist today in certain parts of the southern USA. But in Britain, some 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous period, the swamps formed between the distributary channels of huge delta complexes. The channels brought vast quantities of sediment from distant highlands and built up high mud banks running above the swamp level. If these banks failed, escaping water would cut through the soft swamp deposits, causing a washout. Often sand or silt would be deposited here and the channel would change its course. Water, however, was not always confined to channels. During floods, fine sediment was deposited all over the swamps. These produce the muddy dirt partings in the coal. And occasionally the sea covered the delta, and this left fossiliferous muds, known in the coal fields as marine bands.
During regional subsidence, this complex of environments was buried and compacted as more and more sediments were deposited. During burial, the temperature and pressure rose sufficiently for the peat deposits to be converted to coal. These complex sedimentary processes make predicting what's in front of the coal face very difficult. And they're complicated still further by later geological processes. <laughs> 